Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us this evening for our virtual lecture series to learn about Arbuckle Sport and why it's so important to preserve what remains of this archaeological site. My name is Kelly Berliner, and I'm the Eastern Regional Director for the Archaeological Conservancy. Before handing things off to Drs. Kim and Stephen McBride for the lecture, I'm going to take just a minute or two to introduce the Arbuckle Sport Project and explain a little bit about how the Conservancy came to be involved with the site. It all started some years ago when the McBrides approached the Conservancy to recommend we acquire the Arbuckle Sport site, which is located in southeastern West Virginia, as the owner was ready to sell some land and wanted to preserve the site, if at all possible. We took an immediate interest in the site, given its importance for telling the story of interactions between different cultural groups on the frontier, including Euro-American settlers, African-Americans who were brought to the area as enslaved people, and of course, Native Americans who had lived in the area for thousands of years. At the time, we were unable to come to an agreement with the owner during negotiations, but we kept the site on our radar and took the opportunity to reach out to the West Virginia Land Trust, which is a land trust that operates throughout West Virginia, preserving land with important natural resources. Our hope was that they would also be interested in offering funding assistance for the preservation of cultural and historic resources. And sure enough, they took an interest in the site and a couple years later reached back out to the Conservancy with an interest in forming a partnership to preserve the Arbuckle Sport property. After working through some details of what that partnership would look like, we came to an agreement uh, that stated that the purchase cost, ownership, and management of the property would be shared between the two groups. And further, we've now signed an option to purchase the property and we hope to close on it before the end of the year. In addition, we've also partnered with a local organization, the Greenbrier County Historical Society, with the hopes that their involvement will make it possible for the site to be used for heritage education in schools and also for tourism purposes. With all of this, we are doing some fundraising for the site, including a crowdfunding campaign. So if after the lecture you're interested in donating to help us preserve the site, you can find all of that information through the Archaeological Conservancy's webpage, and we'll also uh, post the link in the chat so you can look for it there. So thank you again for tuning in. If you have any questions about the site or our preservation efforts, please send them us, to us through the chat feature in WebEx, and we'll do our best to get to them at the end of the presentation. So now, without further ado, I will turn the talk, talk over to Drs. Kim and Stephen McBride, who led excavations on the site, and have extensively studied frontier forts like Arbuckle. Thanks. Kim? Uh, the Williamsburg Foundation, and we've had a lot of different uh, small grants and continued support from the West Virginia Humanities Council. We couldn't do this work without the many landowners, so I have highlighted um, landowners for sites I'm going to mention tonight, but there's many others, and we have to give the biggest thanks tonight to Dan Clay and Diana Shea, and along with Greenbrier County uh, Commission for helping preserve the Arbuckles Fort site. So um, I'll get right into Arbuckles Fort. Here's a, I think you can agree, scenic picture. The site is actually right here. You can see my cursor. We're um, on a high uh, knoll looking over this terrace that's at the confluence of Mill Creek on this left side and Muddy Creek on the right side of the screen. If you would take Muddy Creek another three miles or so um, down to Alderson, West Virginia, it joins the Greenbrier River. So this is part of the eventually the Ohio River drainage and the water eventually will make its way to the, the Gulf of Mexico via the Mississippi. Here's a map to show you um, where it is sort of in the map of the state. There's West Virginia, here's the Greenbrier uh, study area that we're going to show you some sites in tonight and then the, this is Arbuckles in red. So I say we began this project a long time ago in 1989 and we have um, probably just still gotten the tip of the iceberg of all the important sites that could be studied. As part of our project we did do archaeological survey to find some of the fort sites, but we can't claim the honors for finding the Arbuckle site because this stone monument that you see in this slide was already there. In fact, been erected in, we think around 1915 by maybe joint efforts of the sons and daughters of the American Revolution. And so the monument, besides showing us where the site is located, it, it shows what an important site 
this is, that it was deemed so important, you know, to be worthy um, of this monument. The monument has a plaque that you can see here, and it talks about Arbuckle's Fort right on the last line. Um, other text is devoted to some other earlier historical events in the region, such as the 1763 attack by Shawnee led by the famous warrior Cornstalk on local families, the Sea family, um, Clendenin family, and others in the Muddy Creek area. So it's, again, it's because of the very important history that happened at this site that we think the monument was erected here. I will give you a little context, but hold on, we'll get to the Arbuckles Fort. <laughs> nice pictures soon. Um, the settlement of the Greenbrier Valley by Euro-Americans begins in the 1740s, uh, late 1740s. Of course, Native Americans have been here for thousands of years. Um, the area was not heavily populated in the 1740s. Complex things were going on between the uh, Iroquois Confederacy and the Cherokee and all the, all the dynamics of diseases, Euro-American settlers passing diseases, you know, to the Native Americans and disrupting the population. So perhaps it looked like uh, Native Americans weren't living here, but it's kind of led to an unfortunate myth that I was taught in Greenbrier County schools that, you know, this was just a hunting ground. Couldn't be farther from the truth. In fact, there's a very nice late prehistoric site within a quarter of a mile of the Arbuckles Fort site. But anyway, to get back to the Euro-American settlement, um, the settlement really had to stop about 1755 with attacks uh, by Native Americans during the French and Indian War. And these settlers then would usually run back to the east, which would be the safety of uh, especially the Stanton, Virginia area, or perhaps to Fort Young in Covington. Uh, settlement starts up again around 1762 or 63, but then that is short-lived again with attacks during what's sometimes called Pontiac's War, um, the attacks alluded to in that plaque on the monument. So the attacks, um, you know, do drive the sailors away, but they just <laughs> couldn't be driven away, you know, for long. These were very, um, very determined settlers. And a, a lasting phase of settlement starts after the 1768 treaties with the Iroquois, uh, Fort Stanwyck, and the Cherokee, the Treaty of Hard Labor. And then the, by 1769 and 70, settlement really is picking up again. But there is a very important factor in that the Shawnee and other uh, Ohio Valley Native Americans were left out of these treaties and felt very left out, very unhappy about that, even though the Iroquois or Cherokee might say they spoke for them, they did not agree. And the Native Americans were also very unhappy with things that were going on uh, in Kentucky at the time, a lot of settlement coming into Kentucky in 1774. So 1774 sees a lot of attacks um, on these settlers and one of the responses was to start building forts. And the fort building goes uh, all through the American Revolution up until the 17, early 1780s. And in fact, forts were probably considered useful maybe until the late 1780s. This defensive system, as we have sort of come to understand it, is something that locally began during the French and Indian War, but was not really honed and that effective, but became very effective during Lord Dunmore's and the American Revolution. And the three components of the system that we see as most important are the militia, which is an ancient English institution in which all able-bodied um, white males were expected to serve. The militia has a little bit of a, you would say, a shady reputation in terms of offensive campaigns, but for local defense, it was really crucial and it was the only thing available because, for example, during the American Revolution, the Continental Line troops were really needed for all the action further to the east. And it was up to these frontier settlers to defend themselves. And the colonial governments were um, not shy about telling them that, that, you know, you're pretty much on your own and we're depending upon you to defend the frontier. Within the militia, there was a very specialized group of people, uh, sometimes called Indian spies or scouts, or uh, earlier they might have been called more rangers. And these men would roam the countryside, um, you know, looking for uh, signs of Native Americans. 
and sending back word, um, you know, traveling around fort to fort or to homesteads and letting people know whether it was safe, whether it was not safe. From uh, the pension applications we read uh, by these men, so we have some good primary documents on this. They had a pretty set circuit that they would travel, you know, maybe being out somewhere between five to eight days at a time. But the base for all this were the forts. And so they were the base for the militia, the refuge for the settlers. That was an incredibly important function. But they were also social and economic centers because this is the time before towns had developed. These, the social settlement system is really very young and very green in this area. So the forts are not just defensive. It's often where court functions were held, marriages, uh, you know, big wedding parties. Um, we've read about probably other social events, trading, you know, stores are set up in the forts. So they're really key uh, sort of entrepot key sites in the settlement system. Don't want to leave out the um, ordinary citizens besides the militia. We do know from a, a wonderful group of records called public claims from the Revolutionary War, where people are hoping to get reimbursed for their contributions to the war effort. We know that uh, local citizens who were not in the militia sometimes also helped. And I won't go through all these functions, but you can see in this slide that they provided some other crucial um, functions. And we figure a lot of this was done by women and children as well as by the men. I mentioned the pensions. Here is an example um, from Michael Swope talking in his pension application about his um, you know, activities as a spy going from fort to fort. And so these are first person accounts. Now they are um, taken down in the 1830s, so there may be a memory issue. For some people, it's probably been, you know, 30, 40, even 50 years, but still, uh, you know, I think um, they're pretty trustworthy and they give us a really good sense of how this defensive system worked. Here's another one of these um, from James Gilliland. And he's talking more not about spying, but so much as how the militia would go out in a group and guard the settlers as they would work their crops. So you get the sense of them roaming around the landscape, working each um, farm by turn. And this is something that we really you know, didn't know about. And I don't think we would know about if it hadn't been for these pension applications. So they're a wonderful record group. We have um, a published reminiscence from Reverend Joseph Doddridge. And he was based more in the central part of West Virginia, and he's writing in the 1820s. But he gives some really interesting information um, on the forts. And I will, you can see in the first one, I've highlighted the yellow, the families belonging to these forts, he mentions. And so you get a real good sense that you know, the forts were sort of organized by neighborhoods. And of course, people would know which fort, I guess, they felt they belonged at. You know, it was very important to know that if you went to the fort, they were going to uh, let you in because it was a dangerous time. Um, to give a little flavor of that, I am going to read this second one. He says, I well remember that when a small boy, the family waked up in the dead of night by an express with the report that the Indians were at hand. The whole family were instantly in motion. All of this was done with the utmost dispatch and the silence of death. Thus it often happened that the whole number of families belonging to a fort who were in the evening at their homes were all in their little fortress before dawn the next morning. So you certainly get a sense from um, Reverend Doddridge that these forts were crucial to their survival. Well, how long did they stay in the forts? Um, we think it varied by place, by the level of danger, certainly in times of more danger, uh, say a year such as 1777, when there were a lot of attacks, they may have had to stay in the forts most of the summer. Uh, the further west you go, for example, in Kentucky, um, most of those settlers would have to stay in the forts during the entire summer season or even the spring and the fall as well. They talk in these quotes that you can see if you have a chance to look at them, they talk about being there in the summer. And then Samuel Gwynn on the bottom talks again about going out to farm the lands um, in a group. There was quite a tension for the settlers. They really most seemed to want to stay at their homesteads. Of course, they want to protect their you know, land and livestock. Um, and the forts 
um, we get the sense get kind of crowded and dirty and aren't the best places to be. But most of the casualties in the area came when settlers would not go to the forts and were um, found by Native Americans at their isolated farmsteads. The forts seemed to really work as a defensive system if the folks would use them. Now, one thing that we wish these records gave us more of, but they do not, are descriptions of the fort. This is again from uh, Reverend Doddridge, and he talks about, um, so it's kind of a generalized a sense of the forts, cabins, block houses, and stockades, and they might, the cabins might be formed uh, in a row to make one of the sides of the fort, for example, and he talks about the floor. If you see at the very bottom, I'll highlight, if you can see that, in some places less exposed, that would be where there wasn't much danger, a single blockhouse with a cabin or two constituted the whole fort. So that's very different from a large fort that might have, you know, four or five cabins and maybe two uh, blockhouses. We get this sense from the archaeology too that there's a lot of variation. What would be called a fort? I think anything that settlers were allowed to, to run to in a time of danger really might be considered a fort. This is another document. This comes from the Draper Manuscripts, which um, is another wonderful source for this colonial history. And this is uh, Captain Spencer Records. He's writing even a little uh, more recently in 1842, and he's describing how forts were uh, made. He talks about, you know, clearing it off and digging. He talks about digging three feet, which I think is too, too much. <laughs> Most of our forts, the, the stockade trenches are not more than two feet deep. But um, really important for us as he gives us this lovely little drawing and you can see here it's sort of a rectangle, um, but it could also be a square. But really interesting are these two things that stick out which are called bastions, that's a French word. So here's his plat of a stockade fort. And the function of the bastion was so that the militia men or a settler, um, which could be men or women perhaps, could stand in these bastions and fire a gun or just observe down the walls or cover the walls, you might think of that word, or enfilade, the, the French term for it. So with two bastions, you can cover all four walls. Now, uh, it's a luxury to have four bastions, but these forts were often built in a time of a uh, sense of great urgency and a time of danger. So if two would do, it seems like two is maybe um, all they often did. This model goes back um, to Europe to hundreds of years. Here's some examples in Ireland in the 1500s, and you can, again, they call them flankers, but here's your bastions, which would protect your walls. And archeological examples um, exist in Eastern Virginia from the 1600s to early 1700s. And again, you can see bastions, you know, there's no um, set rule of which corners they're on, they just need to be opposing corners. And you can see they can even be pretty small, but again, they just provide that line of sight for covering the walls. This illustration is just to give you a sense, uh, and this middle one is what we want to look at, how this was constructed. They dug the trench, put these timbers, upright timbers. We think a lot of the forts um, in the Greenbrier Valley were perhaps maybe not so regular. You may have had, you know, uh, big logs and little logs, or you may have had some gaps. We have evidence of chinking with uh, mud and daub to, to fill in the gaps, but this is the general way. Why don't we have these kind of constructions with earth? Because there wasn't a lot of threat of artillery. Artillery could really uh, knock a big hole in a wall like this in, in short order, but on the frontier, there really wasn't much of that. So this stockade fort is the common type built. Uh, here's a typology that we sometimes use. We like to distinguish between residential forts, which is somebody's house, even though that could have militia stationed there, um, or non-residential militia built forts, because the militia built forts are typically stockaded, whereas the residential might be stockaded, but they might not be, or they might just be really a strong house, you know, something that had a little bit of, of extra effort made for defense. The stockades are usually, we're talking about palisades with corner bastions or blockhouses, or you'll see at Arbuckle's central blockhouses. And a, by a blockhouse, we mean a two-story house with an overhanging second story 
and I had a picture, but sorry, I took it out. Um, where were forts located? Of course, if it's at somebody's house, the house location uh, determines this, and it's mostly because um, you know the settlement patterns, the settlers wherever they're going to get their land, and the, but they do usually put their house near a water source such as a spring. But for the militia forts, these are we find more at a strategic location. So they're almost always on or uh, close to a very prominent transportation route. And also there are more forts in areas of greater population density. Um, you can sort of imagine that. This is um, showing some analysis we have done using a, a, another wonderful record source, the 1775 Tithable List for Western Botetourt County. Greenbrier was part of that um, at the time. And here's some different drainages, which notes, notes they're all by creeks, because creeks and rivers are the major transportation routes at the time. And the number of tithables, uh, tithable is like a, it's a, it's a male being is kind of like a poll tax, but we kind of use it sometimes as a stand-in for a head of household. You could think of as a census. This isn't really quite a census, but it functions like that for us and the number of forts that we know about. So you can see that the, this ratio of tithables to forts does vary from a low of 10 in the Rich Creek drainage to a high of 31 tithables, or let's pretend that might be roughly households in the Great Levels, the Lewisburg area. So there is some variation, but you know we think um, not, not too much. And certainly in some of the more Western areas like uh, Wolf Creek, Indian Creek, those areas are further to the west and probably a little more exposed and a little more dangerous might have needed a few more forts. Um, this table shows you some of the um, men who were fort builders and we have compared uh, several values of their wealth, land, cows, horses, and slaves. And if you look down at the bottom, and you can see Matthew Arbuckle for Arbuckle's fort at the beginning um, at the top, but here's a mean for all the fort builders compared to the mean for all of Greenbrier County um, residents who were taxed. And so you can see the fort builders do have considerable more wealth in all of these values, land, cows, um, horses, and slaves. And I think it's very important that they were uh, people of some means, at least enough that they could help take in settlers, probably help, you know, provide food, and in times of need, as well as just a shelter from the physical danger of being attacked. So as we've researched, um, at, it's probably between 35 and 40 forts um, in this region. We have located about 20 with archaeology, but the preservation of the sites uh, varies greatly. Many of the fort sites are on a, a really strategic spot, so it's no surprise that there have been subsequent buildings there and occupations uh, which lead to disturbances, although they may have their own research value, they lead to disturbances from the standpoint of understanding the fort deposits. So a site like Arbuckle's, which is just a militia fort, it was not Matthew Arbuckle's house, <laughs> um, it was not the landowner John Keeney's house, you know, or Michael Keeney's, the whole Keeney family, you know, lived nearby, but not right at that spot. So that's really important. So the, this site of Arbuckle's fort has tremendous uh, clarity, we would say, in the archaeological record. How do we research these sites? We use um, historical documents, oral history, and then standard methods of archaeological survey and excavation. Here's highlighting some of these documents I've already mentioned, the pensions and the Draper manuscripts. Court records are also wonderful court minutes, for example, deeds to help us find the fort sites. And oral histories are important, but they're becoming increasingly um, difficult, I'm finding. When we started this study in 1989, a number of older oral historians or local historians helped us find these sites. We can't do that today, we're finding. This information, this interest, um, it just doesn't seem to be getting passed down. It's really quite interesting. 
So the sites that we are newly learning about, we're having a lot more trouble finding oral history on them. And I think it's a shame. So I guess I'm glad we started in 1989 and, and not today on many of these sites. Um, an exception in our region is Fort Donnelly, our probably most famous fort because there was a large attack there. And so that has led to some better um, descriptions and detail on it. But typically, archeology span is the main source we have to understand these forts. Now, finding the forts um, presents their own, they present their own challenges because they typically have such a low artifact density. Um, people did not live in these sites for very long. You know, unless there's another site there, they get abandoned in the, usually by the mid 1780s. And when they came to the forts, they really didn't have that much material culture. They were coming in a great rush. So um, doing standard archaeological shovel test survey where you're digging small holes and screening the dirt often misses these fort sites. And we've done tests to prove that. <laughs> we've actually done screen shovel tests on our buckles and we could you know, show you how, how we didn't find the artifacts, but we knew the site was there. So metal detects a good way to start. But once you have a site and you know it's there, um, shovel testing can be very useful to understanding the distribution of artifacts. And in this case, this is a, me and a dear friend, John Kern at Fort Voss in Virginia. This is a French and Indian War fight, uh, fort site. We're even finding fill. This is from uh, construction of the bastion. So that's kind of unusual. This fort did have some, some earthen constructions. But typically it is the excavation of larger units for us um, that has provided the data. So there's some examples of that. Um, I have to give a shout out to all the many dogs we've gotten to meet over the years. Many of these sites are, um, are pasture grazing for sheep. And when you have sheep in these areas, you often need to have dogs. <laughs> so lots of, lots of lovely dogs. And no uh, sheep dogs at Arbuckles, but the Clay and Shea family have had some lovely dogs that we've gotten to know. Um, so some of the detail on Arbuckles Fort. Um, it was ordered to be built by Captain Matthew Arbuckle in 1774 as these attacks were picking up. And um, he's already a leader in this area. He's been, he's led uh, trips to the Ohio River as early as 1764. In October of 1774, now that's after the fort is built, he's going to lead troops to, um, to Point Pleasant expedition from their rendezvous in, at Camp Union or uh, what became Lewisburg. Later, he becomes in charge of Fort Randolph. So he's really a very prominent person. Um, he probably would have had a uh, illustrious political career, but he tragically died at um, age 41 when a tree fell on him. He was uh, helping lay out a road from the Greenbrier settlements to the Bath County area and lightning, big storm, and was killed when this tree fell. We do know from the pension applications, largely, that Arbuckles Fort was the main fort for the area. This is where the settlers would go to if they couldn't stay in their homes, or even if they felt like staying in some of these smaller forts in the area wasn't still safe enough. They might leave a smaller fort and go to Arbuckles Fort in times of extreme danger. Um, we do know that at least twice in 1774 and 1777, Native Americans fired on Arbuckles Fort, and this would have been with guns. <laughs> So we don't have a lot of um, information on these firings, and we think they were um, completely unsuccessful. Well, here's uh, your first picture of what some of the archaeology on the site looks like. Um, there is a plow zone. You can see here, oops, I went too fast. And the plow zone's about 10 to 12 inches. And then we have this light-colored subsoil that makes it, and you can see it right here too, makes it really easy to see the cultural features. So it's a it's a very, um, um, in that sense, easy site. I'm not gonna say it's a completely straightforward or it's certainly not simple, but it's a really wonderful site to easily show up these features. And this, if you can see this depression, that's our first shovel test, one of our first shovel tests on our buckles in 1989. And then there's a line right through here and this is a big pit feature, and there's a profile of it. We think this actually was, it's a sort of celery feature, but we think it was a powder magazine. And then here's a big tra refuse trash feature at our buckles. So the blockhouse, um, 
is one of the more important features of the site. And again, maybe I can't claim credit for finding it because here's that monument. They actually built that right on the chimney of the blockhouse and the chimney would sit right here. And then here's one of the side walls, one of these walls in here. So this, this kind of structure with a central chimney, it's, it's not huge, but it really fits a blockhouse better than any other kind of structure. And so here in this lower, um, right picture, you see sort of an artist's reconstruction or, or a, a sort of guess of what it might have looked like there at the fort. But this was probably where a lot of the activity took place. Probably men slept in this structure. It's probably where they stored, you know, their weapons. This is that cellar that we first found that we think was a powder magazine. And here's that other big refuse pit. So this is kind of the central, one of the central activity areas of the fort. To delineate the fort, and it's it's a, around a quarter of an acre in size, the stockade walls were the most important findings. And you can see they're very easy to see against the lighter colored subsoil. Here's a cross section of one. They're about a foot and a half to two feet deep. And you can even see individual post molds. And here, for example, if you follow the cursor down like this. This is one of those post molds that has sprouted a root from being put in the ground um, so green. Again, they didn't have time to, some of the things they could have done perhaps would have been to burn the ends of the post, but we don't think they had the time or took the time there. Here's a gap in our stockade, which is a gate, and there are two gates at, at our buckles, sort of north and south gates. <laughs> As we find this, found the, the, the stockade trench, and we, we actually found it down here near the monument, and we follow it around. There was great excitement when it makes this bastion. And so that's this bastion here, and then there's another southern bastion down on the other end. We know from post molds that we um, found in the bastions, we know that they were doing some constructing in there, and we think the most likely thing is they would have been making a firing platform. In those. So the bastions, um, you know, a very sort of academic kind of structure. Um, it's washing out a little on mine. I hope you can see it better. Here is the fort from the air. And it is very academic in design. And we feel we understand the layout pretty well, but that's not to say that we know everything. <laughs> and there's still many things that archaeology can help explain um, at this site. This line of stockading here and then a little stretch right here and we don't know if there's more or not um, are really intriguing when we first found these we thought um, oh look they've subdivided the fort this is an area perhaps where they're keeping livestock or something you know they want a separate little activity area but in thinking about this more, and especially in looking at the distribution of the artifacts, for example, here you see on the left gun flints, and these are the more military artifacts and spalls. And on the right, you see lead balls or shot, both dropped or spent. And you'll notice that there's not very much, <coughs> excuse me, along this eastern wall. And, but there is a lot. There's activity along this wall and, of course, some up here. So let me get a drink here. What we think now is that the fort was built in stages. And we think, um, so we're not sure if this and this, <coughs> excuse me, would have been um, contemporaneous. But uh, given all that, uh, Stephen McBride did a, a lovely drawing of the fort and you can see the blockhouse. This is perhaps that first wall, whether it, they still could have left it up, but whether they took it down when they built this one. This cooking area, we think, and there's a sort of a tripod pot cooking. This is an area documented uh, with a large concentration of cast iron kettle fragments archeologically. In this area where we think there's blacksmithing, activities. This is where we found a lot of slag, the residue from blacksmithing. So that's, um. you'll see later that has kind of an interesting tie into some of the artifacts that we have found. And here you can see the, the uh, sort of a, a guess maybe for what firing platforms might have looked like. Well, this two bastion design um, is also seen in play at another nearby fort, Fort Donnelly. Um, which, like Arbuckles, was a militia fort 
to some degree, Andrew Donnelly was an important uh, county militia leader, but it's different in that Andrew's house was here and previously to the fortification. Here's this double chimney in the footprint of the house. So this case, the house kind of functioned like a corner uh, blockhouse, a really big one, in fact. And then, but when they built the fort, they did add two bastions. And in this corner, there's two small pits that we think are privy pits. We do not know where the privies are at Arbuckle. So there's a big, uh, interesting research question yet to be addressed. Um, this is the fort that was attacked, so it's pretty famous in our region. There was an attack right onto the front door of this fort. Um, the group of Native Americans ranges in different accounts from anywhere from 100 to 300, which would be actually a huge group of Native Americans. But the fort did hold eventually. Well, this the bastions, um, you know, as key defensive structures, have been found at two other forts that we have researched. If you go north from Arbuckles into Pocahontas County, Warwick's Fort in Green Bank was also a militia fort. And here we found this bastion right here, and it really does just stop like that. It stops here. It stops here. We don't know why. We don't know if maybe there are buildings sitting on here to form a wall. We found a little more uh, stockade trench here, making a corner, a little more stockade trench here, not making a corner. Uh, we have looked a little more here, but not as thoroughly as perhaps we need to. We have on this fort site lost a little bit of land here, possibly to creek erosion. There's a, the creek is right here, Deer Creek, one of the forks of Deer Creek. But it's an interesting, um, structure, and we just still don't really know, you know, why isn't there a second uh, bastion, but maybe they didn't feel they needed it. This was the area that needed most of the defending. Um, similar, but, but different also, David Jarrett's Fort in Monroe County, and that's the county south of Greenbrier where Arbuckles is, we found this one bastion coming off of a chimney feature. And we think the chimney was the end of the house and we found a cellar right here. So we think, um, and there's a, a gap here, maybe this is a gate, and then we have more stockading and it just ends, you know, just like at Warwick's Fort. We have found two large pits here, which we think were probably underneath structures, and then a number of post molds. So taking this archeological information, and here's the archeological features, there's the cellar, the chimney, the stockading, um, the two pits and the posts. Here's um, Stephen doing a drawing of what this fort might have looked like. So not nearly as academic as the Arbuckles fort site. Well, I do want to leave some time for the artifacts um, because the artifacts at Arbuckles Fort have really great clarity and interpretive power. Nails, and these are all hand-wrought nails made by a blacksmith and could have even been at the Arbuckles Fort site, are the most common artifact. These are um, horseshoe nails here. So um, they use the nails, you know, for putting together things like the blockhouse, but also probably, you know, helping build the stockade. We really find them pretty much everywhere on the site. Now, one of the artifact classes that we have um, really very little of are ceramics. We have redwares, most common. We have things like scratch blue, salt glaze stoneware, white salt glaze stoneware. We have, I think, a little bit of um, Delftware and some other ceramics of the typical ceramics of the 1770s, but not very much. And there's also very little container glass um, at these sites. We do have cut Spanish coins. These are pretty common at uh, sites of the 1770s. This would have been legal tender up in actually into the early 19th century. Um, military artifacts, of course, these you would think is, you know, exactly what you would be finding at a fort site. And we definitely do find a lot of gun flints, especially around the blockhouse area. These are the French or possibly Italian uh, flint. And then these are local flint, the dark flint, usually called Greenbrier shirt. Uh, lead balls. Here's a nice little group uh, found in situ. Perhaps these were in a, a little pouch or something that has disintegrated. Here's some of the balls after they've been cleaned up. And then um, some that are uh, not fired and then these are fired. This is a gun site. So we have some military um, artifacts, but not very many. We th think they were probably being, you know, pretty careful <laughs> with any of the guns or things that were used at the fort site. And as you saw earlier, 
as in plotting the distribution of these artifacts, it's really helpful to try and get a sense of, you know, possible attacks on the fort. Um, we do have some theories about which directions those attacks came from based on the location of the artifacts. Next day, why aren't we going down? Let me get my cursor back on us. There we go. Um, we have some artifacts that um, provide hints about activities that took place, for example, a knife blades for cutting things up, uh, a gig perhaps, you know, for frogging or perhaps being used for fishing, scissors. They're not a whole lot of personal um, items. Buckles um, were common in uh, attire of the colonial period, both at the shoe and the knee. And so we have some pretty nice ornamental buckles, but also some more utilitarian um, buckles that we have found. Cast iron kettle fragments are the second most common artifact class um, after nails. And probably not surprising because these would have been crucial for cooking. And as these pots are heated up, you know, multiple times, heating and cooling, they sometimes would fracture and explode in a sense. So you get all these little teeny pieces. But the pieces were really concentrated at Arbuckles in this area that's not too far from the blockhouse that we think where they were cooking. Um, but the remains from cooking that is most common are the animal bone food remains. And um, it's interesting, too, that these are they're pretty well everywhere on the site, but they seem especially concentrated in some parts of the fort along the edges, interior edges of the stockade wall, which suggests that perhaps, you know, there was an effort to either throw the, the refuse out toward the edges of the fort or to maybe sweep it um, out there. Dr. Terry Martin has looked at a sample of the animal remains and from that has been able to tell us something about the provisioning of the fort. Um, not surprisingly, we have a lot of pork and beef and this, and this is not surprising because this is what we see in those um, colonial records where people are asking for reimbursement. They're asking to be reimbursed for providing cattle and peak pork and um, also venison um, to, the, to the fort. But, um, but mostly uh, beef for providing. Hunting seems to have been a common um, activity for these soldiers also. There's a mix of wild species in the bones that Dr. Martin analyzed. And the elements suggest that the deer are being dressed off site, which is really quite interesting. We haven't had a whole lot of features with ethnobotanical remains, but um, several have been studied by Dr. Jack Rosden, and they show us evidence of wheat and barley at the site. And I was really interested in the gourd seeds um, that came out of some of these samples because we know from some other fort sites that they were using gourds as storage containers for water, you know, perhaps for food stuff. You know, again, the material culture um, is dear and is scarce, and they probably didn't have time to bring a lot of ceramics or wooden buckets, you know, or things like that into the fort. So it's interesting that they might use, use um, the gourds. Well, what you see here is one of our most unusual and interesting um, artifacts really from any frontier fort, but not just our buckles. And it is this little uh, amulet, or it's a little disc of brass, and it's got, you can see this X scratched across it. And we think this X is often found on circular um, artifacts, such as like a spoon bowl or perhaps or the bottom um, of a bowl on sites where enslaved persons lived. And we think it is, and this was found in the blacksmithing area of the Arbuckles Fort. And it's, it's kind of a reference to some Western African um, cosmology, some ideas about the forces of, um, well, I'm gonna probably butcher this, but the life forces of good and evil, you know, as they sort of circulate, you know, in the universe. And so finding this on our buckles was really, really exciting. A few years after we found that, we found a second one, and you see it pictured here, um, in a small pit, which you see pictured here. And the pit also had a broken knife blade in it. And it's a very small pit. It's not one of these, um, typically the trash pits at Arbuckles are big and large and not very deep. You know, this appears to have been a very purposefully dug um, little feature. So um, we think uh, Matthew Arbuckle, we know, owned two slaves. And we think one likely had blacksmithing skills that were put into service um, at the fort. So finding this presence is really um, important. 
we know African Americans were at these four sites, but you know, finding them in the historical records is just really difficult. So it's another way the Arbuckle site um, is exceptional. Well, I have saved this artifact till we're uh, getting toward the end of my slides. Um, this is a little piece of glass <clears throat> that we found, and actually our um, Carl Shields excavating with us helped us find this. We decided to screen the sod, the grass we often take off and save so we can put it back one day when we were waiting for a school group to come. And we said, let's screen the sod. And sure enough, you know, we found this artifact. And at first we didn't know what it was, but you can see it makes the word liberty backwards. And here it is using um, letter sealing wax. So it is like a, it is like a document seal. It might have been a cuff link. You know, it might have been worn in a uh, some kind of amount around the neck, but it's really interesting because we can tie this to a very um, interesting quote from Matthew Arbuckle, the builder of the fort. And I've got the whole quote. It's a little more than what you see there. He said in writing to uh, another um, county defense uh, person, William Fleming, sir, my country shall never have to say I dare not stand the attacks of the Indians or fly the cause they are so justly fighting for. On the contrary, I will lose the last drop of my blood in defense of my country when fighting for that blessed enjoyment called liberty. So we think that's a nice quote. Thank you, Matthew Amar Buckle. It really helps remind us that the context of these forts is within the American Revolution, as well as just uh, Indian wars and, and land conflict. So, um, so those are just a, a few of the artifacts from Arbuckles. Um, I do want to just say a, a final thank you to the many volunteers who've helped in this excavation, many, many individuals, also many university. Uh, these are, as you see in these pictures from Concord University nearby, but many public school classes. Uh, we've had the entire eighth grade of Greenbrier County out twice uh, to excavate. And the site really holds many um, more opportunities for these kind of educational events in the future. So um, I hope you will agree with me that Arbuckles Fort has tremendous uh, research and educational value. This um, is the monument, as um, you might notice a change from that first picture. I showed you it's kind of had some where over the years. The hope is to move the monument down to a little park area closer to the road so that people can pull off and read it and have interpretive signage there, um, you know, about all the things that have happened in this area, both the fort itself, the earlier 1763 attack on the Sea family in the area, the, um, and I'll go to this slide, there was a mill, Hockman's Mill built in 1794, uh, on this property. So an early mill was a store there. This was actually a community center and a post office up until the 1950s. So there's a lot of history um, that we can interpret at this site. Now, I don't have time um, tonight. This isn't really our focus to go into the natural resources here, but I did want just to mention that um, the land, uh, about 25 acres of land involved, has some wonderful natural resources. Also, um, both Mill Creek and Muddy Creek are what's called Group 1, high quality streams for mussels, and the area is considered habitat for five uh, rare, threatened, or endangered species by the West Virginia Department of Natural Resources. These are the Indiana bat, the tongue-tied minnow, the gray comma butterfly and two cave salamanders. So, you know, I think there can be many um, studies done of the, the natural environment here and hopefully, you know, will be a, an extra thing to bring visitors out to this. It's a beautiful area. So I think, let's see, I think that might be my last slide. So I am going to see if I can escape here. And I'll just close it down and sharing my screen. Stop sharing my screen so others can join in and uh, help us with questions. Perfect. Thank you, thank you so much, Kim. Stephen's going to come and join us. Oh, good. Thank you, Kelly. And Stephen's going to come join us now here. So I'm actually going to get up and let him sit, and I'll be sitting right beside him. Great. Great. 
close door. The castle cover. Are we switching seats? <laughs> Are you tired of sitting there? Hello. Oh, just fine. Kim's getting in here. Too. Are you guys ready for questions? Yeah, sure. Okay, great. Um, so I'm, I'm working my way through the chat here, so I'll do my best to get to everybody. Um, of course, if you have a question, send it in now. Uh, through the chat feature is the best way to do it. And to start us off, we have a, a question from Philip McBride. <laughs> <laughs> I know him. <laughs> <laughs> All right, he's testing you here. Um, who would like to know, did the settlers have to pay a fee when they made use of a fort for protection? No, there's no suggestion of that. Mm -hmm. They might have been put to work, I would guess. <laughs> That's <not right. laughs> Okay, and also from Lynn Hoy, uh, we have a question. Did Matthew Arbuckle pay for the fort's construction? That's a good question. I, we don't really know. He was a militia captain and his militia company built it. Uh, I assume they just cut trees down and gathered stone from the creek. Uh, but there could have been some expense in the building. Mm -hmm. if, he, if he did pay for it, he would have sent in a claim to be reimbursed uh, for that at the end of Dunmore's War. And oftentimes the militiamen put in claims to be paid a different rate for fort construction. I guess they would be paid as carpenters, which would be more money than a regular militiaman. But then this, the colony of Virginia, later state of Virginia, uh, or the county would reimburse them. Hey, very good. A um, couple basic questions about the layout of the fort from Nancy Sullivan. Uh, what are the basic dimensions of the fort? And do you know how wide the gates were? Uh, the this, the larger stockade was about 110 feet on a side, you know, had four sides. And one of the gates was smaller. Uh, do you remember the size? Yeah, I was going to say one is about three feet and one is about four and a half feet or so. We, we kind of... Um, oftentimes refer to it as the wagon gate, the bigger one, like the wagon or cart gate, and then the small just person gate for the smaller one. Okay, thank you. Have you guys found any human remains? That question is from Steve and Janet Weiser. No. <laughs> No human remains. <laughs> it's a good thing. That's a good thing. <laughs> it, it is. <laughs> um, I would say there, there is an account of one of the firings on the fort, and there's an account of a settler who was killed and who was buried not too far away from the fort, but no mention ever of anyone being buried in the fort. Got it. Got it. And now, Stephen <laughs> Borey already has a couple of questions. Um, First is, have you found a well within the walls of the fort? No, no well. And they probably got their water from uh, Mill Creek um, and just put it in, you know, brought it up. It's not very far and put it in barrels. That would be my guess. Right, right. You'd also like to know, were there visible signs of the walls before excavation? And I don't. Aside from no. being there, I don't think there was anything, right? No, there was not of the walls. There was a, a kind of a mound where the blockhouse was because of the chimney fall, the rock. There was kind of a rock pile that was covered with dirt because they, you know, the site had been farmed. And apparently they just kind of avoided that chimney area, but there was no sign of any of the stockades or any of the cellar features or anything, I think, because of the plowing. Right. Uh, and related to the botanicals, is there any indication that there was corn within the fort? 
Or any any corn remnants found within the fort? I believe there was. Yeah, I think we've got a lot of domesticated grains as well as evidence of gourds. Right, I, I mentioned gourds, wheat, and barley, but I think there is corn also. <laughs> yeah, I believe so, but I can't completely remember. <laughs> okay. okay, excuse me as I work my way If Also from Stephen, do you know how much cleared land there was around the fort historically? Not really, uh, but my guess is, it, was a farm and had been moderately cleared. And if it hadn't been, they would have cleared it because they usually they would like about a 300, 400 yard uh, firing area around the fort so people couldn't sneak up on you. <laughs> <laughs> and they also wanted the trees for construction and, and firewood and other. Uh, uses. But we don't have any documentation on it. You know, the the main documentation on trees is like in land surveys because they'll use trees as corner markers. So you can get an idea of the different species, but not really the density. Thank you. And I can answer this next one uh, from Janet Griffin, who would like to know if the Native American story of the fort will be included in the interpretive material. And that's an absolutely yes. Um, our yeah. hope is that once the site is preserved, the three partners that are involved, the Western, excuse me, West Virginia Land Trust, Archaeological Conservancy, and the Greenbrier County Historical Society can work together on outreach and interpretive materials that would tell mm -hmm. the complete story of the area. So the Native American mm -hmm. perspective, uh, the Euro-American settlers, and of course the African-American mm -hmm. story of the port as well. Mm -hmm. One thing back to the other agricultural question was that that land had been John Keeney's and uh, dating back to the 1750s. So it was very likely, you know, pretty cleared since it had been settled for about 20 years off and on uh, in the 1750s and 60s. And then it came back probably circa 1770. And a couple of archaeology specific questions here from Lance Green. Uh, how well have you been able to define discrete activity areas such as blacksmithing, kitchens, et cetera? And did you define them with material assemblages and or feature patterns? Uh, both. The, the blacksmithing, we had artifacts, particularly slag uh, from burning, and then also scrap metal uh, like bar stock, cut bar stock. Um, a lot of charcoal uh, and we had a large one large feature which probably had been, might have been a um, where somewhere near where the forge was and then with uh, we we have an activity area where we think there was an outdoor cooking area I think you've talked about it yeah. then we had uh, a lot of kettle fragments um, and then some other evidence of burning we also have evidence of um, obviously the blockhouse, but also some cellar features that likely had uh, buildings on top of them. Um, any other thing you can well, think of? I guess I would um, add, we've done a little metal detecting outside the walls of the fort and there are, you know, period artifacts out there too, not in great density, but that's something that really could be researched more because Typically, um, if people would come to the forts and we think and if they were feeling a little more relaxed, it wasn't real dangerous, they might be, you know, camping out outside the fort so that they could run in when they had to. They didn't have to stay in the crowded and sort of stinky <laughs> inside of the fort. So what happened outside the fort is really another area that needs more research and we've just never gotten to that. Speaking of potential, uh, for further research, we've got a question from uh, Susan K. Ali about whether or not you've considered using LIDAR 
for these sports sites or outside of these sports sites and what potential research that could open up? Uh, we have on some and um, it, there is, can be helpful, not so much with the forts themselves, but with the like old road networks and things like that. Uh, there's one fort that uh, it's been really helpful on because that fort was never plowed and you can actually see the fort like uh, in this when you get like into the Civil War when you have earthen forts a lidar is really helpful with that but most of these like are buckle because of the cult history of cultivation uh, there's really not any kind of elevation difference other than maybe for old roads that the LIDAR is helpful. You know, we have um, infrared photography is perhaps useful on some forest sites when they're plowed, and you can be looking for differences in soil colors if, if there, you have a midden uh, buildup in the forts. So, yeah, but as Stephen mentioned, the LIDAR is tough on these because they've mostly been plowed and there's just there's no relief. You know, and, and when the forts would be abandoned, we assume people would have come and used that timber, you know, the wood. And so it just all kind of goes away. OK, we have a lot of questions coming in, so I, I apologize. We won't be able to get to everybody. So I'll, I'll pick a couple more here. Uh, here we go. Uh, from Alan Kamba, you mentioned pet Spanish coins. Why are these coins common in the 1770s and why are they cut? <laughs> they're, they're making change. <laughs> <laughs> I'll let you want to say a little more on that. Well, the, it was just um, silver and, and the silver was, it didn't matter where it was minted. Its value is based on the precious metal. And actually what they would call specie money, you know, hard money, was rather rare. A lot of the economy was uh, basically barter. You would trade agricultural products or furs for other goods. And Spanish money was really the most common because it was just very plentiful because of the silver mining. And as Kim said, they, they're cut to make change out of them. You know, you'd have a quarter, you cut it in half, it was 12 and a half cents, and you could just keep cutting it. <laughs> and it was based on the weight of the silver. Um, and they were legal tender in the United States, I can't remember exactly, but I think maybe like until about 1840, uh, somewhere around there. Because it was, you know, unlike now where uh, coins are sort of symbolic like paper money back then they weren't they were valued by the metal thank you i'm actually going to do two more just because i think we're getting so many great questions and then if you have any beyond that we'll try to see if we can get them answered and posted on the website so final two okay. do that. Um, Typically, how far away would a family farm be from the fort? Uh, in other words, and, and this is from Ann Lucas, um, would you be able to run for your life or would you have to plan for your trip uh, if it was several hours or longer? Um, I, I think five, five or six miles would probably be about the longest. Uh, and sometimes you'd have time to do a little planning and packing and sometimes you wouldn't. You, you'd have to skedaddle over the fort pretty quickly. Uh, and most people were probably about, you know, half that distance, you know, on horseback, some maybe on foot. So it would, could take a while to get there. And as Kim had mentioned in the system, the the spies would be running, looking around for signs and would try to warn people, uh, hopefully to give them enough time to get to the fort. Uh, but sometimes they didn't make it. <laughs> okay, and last question, this will be a combo here. So uh, Debbie Deem and Evzdar, uh, at Arbuckle's Fort, any evidence of children or women um, that would tell us about their role or uh, contributions they made to the fort? Um, I don't think we have any evidence of children um, I know what one's, about this wizards. Yeah, we do have some toys. Uh, that's Kim's right. Uh, there's a 
kind of a toy called a whizzer. It's hard to say exactly if it was played with by children. You know, adults may have played with them too, but it just kind of make a whirling noise. It's like a disc of lead with a, holes in it that a string would go through and you would twirl it around. Mm -hmm. um, we have, I, I don't think on our buckles, but on some other forts, we'd, you know, have some thimbles uh, from sewing that are really quite small. Um, and probably, you know, thimbles, oftentimes we sort of associate them with women, but, you know, you can't really say 100% because men, particularly in the army, would have to pair their own clothes too. But these are so small that I think they would have been women's. Uh, they wouldn't really fit on men's fingers. <laughs> I mean, I can say even though we the artifacts are, you know, are pretty low density, so... Maybe it's not uh, unexpected that we don't have good hard evidence of women and children. We do know they were there. You know, the accounts talk about whole families coming to the forts. Mm. And we have accounts of lots of people being born in the forts. So, you know, we, we know women or children are there, mm -hmm. um, you know, from that. But um, we have some clothing items, but they're mostly those flat coin buttons and they're not really gender diagnostic. specific. So it's hard to say. Um, it's a diff it's difficult. But I, I, some toys, and then I, I can't remember if Arbuckle has any thimbles, but I know some of the others do, which again are so small. I think they're women's thimbles. Great. Well, thanks so much. If you can, I'll send these questions over to you, Kim and Stephen. Uh, there's a couple of okay, sure. if we can get some answers and post them up online. So. Happy to do that. Cool. Oh, and I wanted to um, tell people about this booklet and get to mention. I think when you registered, um, you saw a link to this booklet, and it includes about, you hold it up. <laughs> Thanks. It, it includes information on our Buckles <laughs> Ford and two other Ford sites that we've excavated not too far away. So I think through that, um, if you have any trouble, that link should get you it, but also you can go, if you would just Google Frontier Defense McBrides, you would get a link to this. It was kindly posted for us by the West Virginia Division of Culture and History. Yeah, we have a link to it as well in the chat. Uh, where we posted and this was um, as well as a link for the uh, classy webpage where we're doing the excellent. Craft we would point out that it was funded by the West Virginia Humanities Council, so it's a, a, good, a very well-deserved plug for them. But um, these booklets, this one quickly went out of print, they, and so that's why we've got it uh, put on the web. But, you know, they've been very popular. Yeah, and I can say it's an excellent booklet. I use it, so it's, it's really wonderful. Uh, so just to wrap up this evening, thank you so much to everybody who tuned in to join us. Uh, it's been really wonderful. And to Kim and Stephen, just a tremendous thank you from myself in the Conservancy for working with us on the Arbuckle Sport Project, as well as working with us on looking for other sites to preserve in that area. Uh, we couldn't do it without you guys. <laughs> it's been really, really wonderful to have such a well-researched site. Uh, as well as just that local connection and that local support throughout this project. So thank you so much. Thank you. Well, thank you. And thanks, the and thanks to all the folks who've donated. And if if you're interested, this will be a great time. They're trying to sort of wrap up this crowdsourcing campaign. <laughs> Yes, our plan is to close by the end of the year, and, and we have a whole page uh, through the Archaeological Conservancy's website where you can learn all about the project. We're getting videos posted up there and lots of information, and I imagine uh, we'll also have a connection or a link to this presentation up there or any information about this presentation. So if you missed some of it or you missed some of the slides, that's a great place to check it out. So um, thanks again, everyone, for tuning in, and have a great night. Thank Bye. you. Bye-bye. Thank <laughs> you.